Again, I would like to reiterate my appreciation for the invitation to be here with you. Appreciate the good work done by the Bellevue congregation. Uh, appreciate uh, uh, Sister Mowry and all that she does in this work and the different members here. Uh, appreciate all you do. Uh, appreciate the men here who have participated in putting together the manuscripts and the lectures. Uh, I've certainly uh, grown to my knowledge sitting here. I was asked the question, uh, have I learned what I learned from somebody's lecture? He wanted to know. Uh, I think it's kind of amassing different things, and I think uh, pretty much everybody who's been here has learned uh, one thing without doubt, that this doctrine, this system of doctrine, is thoroughly ludicrous. And I think anybody who would be present with an honest heart and an open Bible uh, would be readily able to see that. Now, almost without fail, the most exciting time of a lectureship is the time of the open forum, the period of question and answers. You think about the legendary open forums that were held during the tenure of Guy and Woods at the old Freed Hardeman. Uh, I've heard about the back and forths that would take place with, between him and Brother Warren about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I have a couple of books that detail the masterful way he would answer some of the questions that were brought before him at those times. Uh, and likewise, here at the Bellevue Lectures, it's certainly an enjoyable and informative time. Uh, it seems that everybody's interest uh, uh, picks up perhaps a little bit uh, during that time. And uh, I, I think I mentioned to the speaker of uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, when I was looking up at that podium and seeing that gleam reflecting back at me, I just thought something just looks right about that open forum. Uh, <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but can you imagine, as we think about how enjoyable and profitable it is for us to have the opportunity to learn from men who have had years and decades of study of the scriptures, can you imagine what would have been the opportunity to be able to ask questions directly of the Lord, to have a personal question answer session on, in, in that way? The disciples, the apostles particularly of our Lord Jesus Christ, were blessed with that opportunity, no doubt on many occasions. And some of them are probably are not recorded for us. But we do have an occasion where we have some particular questions that the apostles of Jesus asked him, as recorded in Matthew 24, verse 3, Mark 13, 3, and Luke 21, verse 7. We find this then called the Olivet Discourse, uh, basically a question and answer. We read in Mark, thir Mark 13, 3, And as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, Peter and James and John and asked, Andrew asked him privately, asked him concerning significant spiritual matters. And he provided the answer to their questions. We read about in other occasion, recording Luke 17, verses 22 and following. When Jesus told his apostles, the days will come when here's what you're going to want to see and you will not see it, but here is the answer. And so not only was he able to answer their questions, he was able to understand questions that they would have in the future and provide the answers for those questions. We might call that discourse that's recorded in Luke 17, 22 and following the days of the Son of Man discourse. That recorded in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21. That's commonly called the Olivet Discourse, and it's so called because of where it took place. Again, Mark 13, 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple. That's where the discourse occurred, and so it's sometimes called the Olivet Discourse. Sadly, false interpretations, misinterpretations of the Olivet Discourse lie at the root of more eschatological error than perhaps any other section of Scripture with the possible exception of Revelation chapter 20. But that's certainly not because Jesus did not speak clearly and truly. It's not because the Holy Spirit who inspired its recording did so fallibly. No, it's because again people approach the scriptures in a way that they should not. 
In 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, we find Peter speaking about some things that Paul wrote. But he had written them with wisdom given unto him. He wrote by inspiration, but there were some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, they twist as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And so while Jesus gave these passages, gave this question answer for the information of the apostles, for saints yet to come and thereby, by extension, for us, we can be blessed by understanding those things. But we do, do need to look carefully. We do need to be willing to be workmen, studying, rightly dividing, rightly handling that word of truth. And so it's with this that we come to these texts, the Olivet Discourse and that discourse of Luke 17, 22 and following that we might call the Days of the Son of Man Discourse. Well, let's begin by considering the topic or topics of the Olivet Discourse. That's an essential part of communication, is it not, to know what topic is under discussion. If you are in a school, a lecture being delivered at a school, you want to know what the t topic is under discussion. If you're reading a book, you want to know what it's about before you're going to understand it. Even having a conversation with a friend, you want to understand what the topic is under discussion. Uh, imagine you walk into an assembly hall in the middle of some kind of speech, and you hear the speaker saying, I'm not a fan. You don't know what that means. Is the speaker saying, I'm not a fan of the Chicago Blackhawks? Is he saying, I'm not a fan of some particular action that somebody took? Is he saying he's not a fan of sports at all? Is he saying he does not possess fanatical traits? When he says, I'm not a fan, is he saying he's not a circular mechanical device designed to produce a current of wind, what does he mean? Well, perhaps by staying a little bit longer, you might be able to discern from the context what he means. And thankfully, as we come to the Olivet Discourse, we're not left to have to wander in mid-speech. We're told what will be discussed. We're introduced to these things. I invite your attention to Matthew 24, which we're, we'll primarily be focusing on as we look at the Olivet Discourse. And note what is asked. Note what is said. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, this is verse 3 of Matthew 24, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Well, what are these things? Well, just immediately we had read previously in verses 1 and 2, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so when shall these things be? What did Jesus just speak about? He spoke about the destruction of the temple. We do know from history that that would occur in A.D. 70. We are blessed to know that from hindsight. They couldn't know exactly when that would take place. And so they asked the question, when shall these things be? There is at least one other question, perhaps two, that are recorded in Mark and Luke that we're not informed about here. But in Mark 13 and verse 3, we're told that the disciples asked him, what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Luke 21, 7. What sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And so they'd asked for a sign. We know that oftentimes Jesus expressed displeasure when people would ask him for signs. We do see the Jewish leaders coming to him and asking for signs. And he would tell them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But those signs were signs, the requests, excuse me, for signs were expressive and reflective of the doubt they had, of the testing that they were trying to make of Jesus, of really trying to disprove who he was. That was their intent. That's what they were seeking. But here is the disciples are asking, they're asking, how can we know that this is going to take place? And Jesus would respond. He would provide signs that would provide an incredible asset when these things would occur. 
when the destruction of Jerusalem would take place. And we read this third question. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Again, Matthew 24, verse 3. And so, what shall be the sign of thy coming? What shall be the sign when the world ends? Now, the disciples, we know, as Jesus was on earth with them, they misunderstood a lot of things. We're told time and again about how Jesus would say something. They didn't know what it meant until the other side of the cross. Then they would understand what these things meant. After Jesus was risen from the dead, then they grasped these things. And so they probably thought they were speaking about the same event. As they're thinking about the destruction of Jerusalem, perhaps they're thinking, surely this will be the end of the world. But can, there could be no question, regardless, this is what they asked about. And so as we look at the Olivet Discourse, it's important to understand that what we find following, what Jesus will say, serves as answers to these questions. Now as we do consider the topics of the Olivet Discourse, there's something we need to address with regard to Max Kingism, a realized eschatology. Uh, Max King puts forth the view that Matthew 24 is simply a continuation of Matthew 23. Matthew 23, we know, does speak about the judgment to be brought upon the Jewish state. He will talk about the destruction of the temple. And so if Max King's idea that it's simply a continuation of Matthew 23 is true, well then that's what the entire Olivet Discourse needs to be but does not bear any marks really of being a direct continuation of Matthew 23. There, are, there is some similarity of subject, but Jesus is not speaking to the same audience. He was speaking to the Jewish leaders. Who was he addressing in Matthew 23? Scribes and Pharisees. He would say, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Here's the case with you. Here's what's going to happen to you. But here we're saying that, here we see that it's Peter and James, John and Andrew, who are asking him privately concerning matters. And again, he's answering these particular questions. And so it's not a continuation in the sense that Matthew chapter 6 is a continuation of Matthew chapter 5, or Matthew 7 is a continuation of chapters 5 and 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. No, this is an altogether different discourse delivered at a different time and a different location to a different group of people. And so, no, this is not a continuation of Matthew chapter 23. But then let's look then, as we look at the Olivet Discourse, let's see the answers to questions 1 and 2. That's what we find in the first part of the Olivet Discourse. We find in verses 4 through 8, the beginning of sorrows. Here it speaks about warfare arising earthquake, pestilence, these different things that are going to occur. And Jesus is saying, these things are going to happen, but just know this is not yet. This is not really when this is going to happen. These are the beginning of sorrows. Then in verses 9 through 14, it speaks about afflictions and stumbling blocks for the disciples of Christ. Different things that were going to happen to them. We're in verse 10, and then shall many be offended... They'll be caused to stumble and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. But, verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And so there are some things that you're going to have to go through before this comes to pass. Before we get to the destruction of Jerusalem. Verses 14 and following, then speak about time to flee. We read in verse 14, or verse, let's go ahead, verse 15. When therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand of the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mounts. Daniel has spoken about the desolation, the desecration of the temple by Gentile hands. What would this refer to particularly here? We're told very clearly. 
in the Olivet Discourse, although it's not recorded by Matthew. But read in Luke 21 and verse 20, When you therefore shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof draweth nigh. The two are equated. Here was the force that would make desolate, Roman hands, wicked hands, that would defile the temple, that would defile that holy city. And so this is the time, and we read in verse 16, let them which be in Judea flee into the mounts. Now again, we mentioned that the Olivet Discourse, or at least misinterpretation of the Olivet Discourse, lie at the root of a whole lot of his scatological error. And so it's not only our realized eschatology neighbors that are falling into error with this, but premillennialists. Those who would say that all of this refers to the end of the world. But why is this being said? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why only give instructions to one small group of people if it's a universal judgment taking place here? And why flee into the mountains? What good is fleeing going to do at the judgment day? There will be no way to flee, no place to flee, no reason to flee. And so why do we have these flight instructions, we might call them, here in these verses? But that's what we find provided. And it speaks about the tribulation that's going to exist in that day and the warning that is given. And we read in verses 29 through 31 about an ap ap apocalyptic figure being given for when that takes place. And in verses 32 and following, Jesus gives the parable of the fig tree. You see this fig tree, you see it putting forth its leaves, that's telling you something. You are experienced with the climate in which we live. You know that that for us is the sign of summer. And so likewise, when you see these signs, saying, I've given you those signs now. I'm not going to give you any more signs. When you shall see these things come to pass, you can know that it is near. It is about to happen. What's about to happen? These things, the destruction of Jerusalem is about to happen. We read in verse 34, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So again, this is not looking forward to a universal judgment yet to happen. It's referring to something that would happen long past, when there were some yet living at that time. And Jesus goes on and gives assurance about those things that he has said in verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. And so the earth would not continue to exist forever. The physical heavens would not continue to exist forever. They would pass away, but his words would not. Here we then see the topical transition. He is going to go on from here and answer then question number three. And we see a number of marks that we do have a topical transition. Jesus goes on and says in verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But of that day. What day? He had just spoken about heaven and earth passing away. Of that day knoweth no man. We see then a transition. As Jesus particularly has previously been given, all kinds of signs. Now he's saying, no signs. You just don't know when this is going to happen. There is a mark of transition right there. Notice also two little words that begin verse 36. But of. In the original, that is peri-de. P-E-R-I-D-E. And this is a transitional marker we find in various places of Scripture. I invite your attention with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and let's note how we see the Apostle Paul using this as a transition marker, to, trans to make a transition from topic to topic. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul had been speaking about fornication, warning them to flee fornication. We'll read then at the beginning of chapter 7, Now concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And so he's going to address things that the Corinthians had written him about. 
They'd obviously written him about marriage. He's going to address those things, and so he's changing topic. And that now concerning Paris death. We're changing topic right here. Look at 1 Corinthians 7.25. He goes on to says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. And so he's going to discuss virgins, but now concerning Paris death. Dead. We do find this term being translated in the English in different ways, and so it can be a little difficult for the English reader to understand. It's but of in Matthew 24 and verse 36, but it is the same phrase and performs the same function. It is a transitional marker. Again, 1 Corinthians 8 1. Moving to a different subject, now is touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And so we're moving on from talking about marriage, from talking about virgins. Now we're going to talk about eating things offered to idols. Peri de is what's used there. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. As he has discussed abuses of the Lord's Supper in chapter 12, he said, verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now concerning again, peri de. We know that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the great resurrection chapter, which certainly stands in refutation of realized eschatology. We come to 1 Corinthians 16, 1, where Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Peri de. Now concerning. We read in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 12, As touching our bro brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but when he will come, he, when he shall have convenient time. And so these were different things about which the Corinthians had asked him. They had asked him about marriage. And so he says, Paride, we're going to discuss that now. About the collection, he says, okay, Paris Dale, we're going to discuss that now. They'd asked him about Apollos, Paris Dale, we're going to discuss that now. Moving from topic to topic. It's a transitional marker. We do see Jesus elsewhere using Paris Dale as a transitional marker. In Matthew chapter 22, when the Sadducees, the, again the forerunners of the realized eschatologists, came to Jesus and brought forth their scenario that they thought Jesus couldn't answer. This uh, woman who had been married to seven different brothers consecutively after each had died, following the Leverett law of marriage, and asking the question, well, in the resurrection, whose of them will, will they be? Well, Jesus went on and crushed that type of idea and saying, you're missing the point altogether. They're not going to marry at all. We'll read then in verse 31 of Matthew 22, but as touching, pre death. Okay, I've answered, I've crushed your, I've, I've gone ahead and answered your question. But now let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the resurrection of the dead in general. And so that's what we find in Matthew 24 and verse 36. We have a very obvious transitional marker. Note also that in the first part prior to Matthew 24, 36, we had seen these things being mentioned. The disciples had asked him, when shall these things be? Regarding what Jesus has spoken about, the destruction of the temple. But after this, we don't see these things being mentioned at all. From this point on, he goes on and speaks about that day. He will speak about that day four times in the remainder of the discourse. A single day had not been mentioned prior to this, but now he does. So many obvious markers of a topic topical transition. Now we ask again, what is that day? The obvious answer is, as he had said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but of that day. He's referring to heaven and earth passing away that day. That literal day when heaven and earth shall be destroyed. Now Max King, in trying to deny the force of this, will say, well, heaven and earth passing away there is just figurative. Just figurative. Well, then what's he mean when he says, my words shall not pass away? Figuratively, they won't. But literally, they might. That takes away all the force of what Jesus had said. Jesus had said, scripture cannot be broken. Figurative? 
I mean, did he really mean it? Or might it be broken in some way? When we read about the fact that Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Jesus said what he meant. He meant what he said. He meant it. When he said that day, he was going on discussing that day when heaven and earth shall pass away. Now there are some who say, well, that's not a very clear antecedent. It's not real obvious that that's the day he's referring to. Okay, well, let's grant that for just a moment. Sometimes in Scripture, we do find Jesus referring to that day without any prior reference to a particular day. But what day does he mean when he uses that? In Matthew 7 and verse 22, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. It's speaking about a day when mankind is going to give answer to Jesus. What day is that? That's the judgment day. We all, shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. That's what's being spoken of in that day. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, Paul has said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He was looking forward to a time of reward. That day, the same day when there would be others giving answer with no answer to give to Jesus, the same day when Jesus knew he would be rewarded, he would receive the crown of life, the crown of righteousness which the Lord had pr promised to them that love him. He knew he was going to receive that because he had committed it to him against that day, that final day of judgment. And so we see then the remainder of the Olivet Discourse serving as an answer to question Number three, the question regarding what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? When is going to be the final end of the world? And it's going to speak about that. Is you going to use illustrations from prior judgment? It'll speak about the time of Noah. It's not going to be very obvious or not, it's not going to be clear. All of a sudden it's going to strike like it was in the days of Noah. And so we'll speak about the necessity of watching, of being ready, not being like those five foolish versions discussed in the first parable of Matthew 25, of not being like that one talent man discussed in the second parable of Matthew 25, of not being like those on the judgment day described in Matthew 25 verses 31 and following who will not have looked out for those in need because when they failed to do so, they failed to help Jesus himself. But those who had done so had helped Jesus himself. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. What day are we talking about? Final judgment. We're not talking about things that happened at the destruction of Jerusalem at that point. Let's then look at the Days of the Son of Man discourse recorded in Luke chapter 17. About your attention there. We read in Luke 17, verse 22. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. Well, it perhaps been a little clearer at the beginning of the Olivet Discourse what was going to be discussed. What is a day of the Son of Man? That's not quite as obvious to us. We know that the Son of Man is a reference to Jesus Christ himself. Matthew 16, 13, as Jesus said to his disciples, he said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He equates then himself with being the Son of Man. He was more than that, as Peter would affirm, but he was indeed the Son of Man. So it speaks about a day of the Son of Man. But what is a day of the Son of Man? A day of Jesus in this respect. There are those who affirm that that refers to one of the happy days when Jesus walked with his disciples on the earth. There are those who will say that that is referring to heaven, eternal life itself. There are those who will say it refers to having some kind of foretaste of heaven. And then there is the view that this refers to the opportunity for salvation, for redemption. 
an opportunity which not, would not continue to exist. The, vault, the view put forth by H. Leo Bowles. But as we look at the discourse a little closer, it doesn't seem like any of these are what is meant by a day of the Son of Man. We'll read in verse 30, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And so it mentions a day, it mentions the Son of Man, and it mentions Him being revealed. In what way? Dwelling with the disciples again upon the earth? Is it speaking about the eternal life? Is it speaking about the opportunity for salvation? No, it is spoken about judgment. We see various verses speaking about judgment. The term the day of the Lord has been discussed a little bit during this lectureship, a reference that is used to judgments of various stripes. We see the term the day of the Lord being used with regard to the judgment against Babylon. We see it being used to refer to the judgment of Pharaoh at the river Euphrates. We see it being used to refer to the judgment being brought upon Jerusalem in 586 B.C. by the nation of Babylon. Of course, we do see it referring to final judgment in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. And so we see it being used in these different ways. And so like as the day of the Lord in similar terms refer to a day of judgment, so it seems that a day of the Son of Man is referring to a day of judgment. Now he's saying you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. So it mentions the plurality of days of the Son of Man, but as you go through, it seems that he is focusing upon one particular. Jesus is focusing on one particular judgment in this discourse. We note some things about it. In verse 24, Jesus would say, For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part of, under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. We see this verse paralleled in the portion of the Olivet Discourse that is speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. This, verse, this parallel passage is found in Matthew 24 and verse 27. Now the idea that parallel and similar language is used in and of itself proves nothing. But it's worth noting that certainly it can apply to the destruction of Jerusalem. And that makes sense. As lightning strikes one particular place on earth, but it's visible far beyond that one singular place when it strikes. At nighttime, you could step outside this building and lightning might be striking miles away, but it's going to be lighting up the sky way over the other direction. You can still see it over there. When Jerusalem would be destroyed, people in Athens, people in Alexandria, people in other places of the world would hear about that, and that would certainly serve as a warning to them, don't rise up in rebellion at this time. It would give a warning to them as well, just as the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. had served as such. Verse 25, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation, we read. Generation refers to those who share a, a, a relationship of time, a temporal relationship. But not only that, it also speaks about those who share a familial relationship. If you look at the, you can look in the book as well for some information provided by Bauer Danker Orton Gingrich's lexicon. Uh, it can refer to as well the genetic relationship. And as we find Jesus using the term this generation, we find it's typically him referring to a generation of Jews. Jesus would speak about that generation, the judgment that would come upon it. He has spoken of that in Matthew chapter 23. But perhaps most decisively is what we find being said in Luke 17, <clears throat> verse 31. <clears throat> in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away, and that he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. <clears throat> Again, we find that paralleled in the portion of the Olivet Discourse discussing the destruction of Jerusalem. But that was referring to flight instructions. That's saying you need to get out quickly. You don't have time to go back into your house and get everything out. You need to get out quickly. You need to hightail it out of there. We don't find instructions like that in the second part of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verses 36 and following. We find them in the prior point. That makes sense there. 
But it makes no sense why, with regard to the final judgment, somebody would be instructed to get out of there quickly. It will serve no purpose. Again, there will be no way to flee, no place to flee, and no reason to flee. That said, do these discourses teach realized eschatology? Max King's primary argument from these is that you find language from both sections of the Olivet Discourse being found in the days of the Son of Man discourse in Luke 17, 22 and following. And he says, well, therefore, it must be that since he is using language to refer to what you say, us, are two separate judgments, then this must just, then they must actually be referring to the one same judgment. The reasoning does not follow. We find throughout Scripture similar language being used to refer to judgment. Again, our time is slipping away, so you can look at the book and see about some references to the language that is used about different kinds of judgment, but it's used again and again. Judgment came place, took place in the days of Noah. People need to be prepared for that. Judgment took place in the days of Lot. People need to take place, be prepared for that. And there is certainly a sense in which the destruction that took place upon Jerusalem in AD 70 is a type of of the destruction that is yet to come. When the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, all that is therein, everything is going to be burned up when that final day of judgment comes. It is a type of that. But for there to be a type, there also has to be a remaining antitype. Has to be. We see Jesus using similar language to refer to different occurrences, and likewise he does the same in these two discourses. We understand that perhaps these two discourses are not the easiest of all scripture to understand, but we can understand. When we read what Paul wrote, what other inspired writers of the New Testament wrote, we can have their knowledge we're told in Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 4, we can have their understanding in the previously unrevealed mystery of the gospel. But we're going to have to be diligent students. Our task then is to look to these things and know that there is a judgment day for which we must be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to be sure that we have obeyed the gospel. We need to be sure that we are living faithfully. We need to be sure that we are standing against false doctrine and standing with the Lord where we can look forward to standing in eternity. Thank you.